folk singer who's dead after she was attacked by a pair of coyotes. What is the monkey doing? Tell me what's monkey. He, he ripped her face off. We actually have a trainer in the water with one of our whales. If I show weakness, if I retreat, I may be hurt. I may be killed. Baby Azaria Chamberlain was taken by a dingo back in 1980. Everybody, welcome back to Man It Is The Only True Crime Podcast on the internet where all the killers are real animals, whether it's biting, scratchings, maulings, or clawings, we're here to talk about it. As always, I'm your host, Jimothy Chaps, aka uh, Big Papa Bear, Plumpy McDumpy. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't I don't like that at all. Plumpy McDumpy, that's I'm I want to delete this because that's something that'll stick. Uh, welcome back, everybody, for our first episode in two weeks. Uh, yes, sorry for the little uh, break there, but as I said a couple of weeks ago, I had a show on last week. We had School of Rock, the musical at the Civic Theatre in Newcastle, um, and we had a fantastic time. I did blow my voice out a little bit. Um, it was weird. I mean, I know I talk about being sick a lot on this show, um, but I thought I just like lost my voice, but for the last like three days which is about a week after the show closed, I've been just coughing up phlegm. So I think I might've just had like a respiratory virus as well, but we pushed through. We had a fantastic time. We saw like 4,000 people come through to the theater and uh, it was honestly uh, one of the highlights of my, my young life. So thank you to all of those in, who listened to the show, who came and watched. Um, we, for some reason, got a lot more followers on like Instagram and stuff during that week. And I thought, like, I noticed that my, um, my biography in the program mentions the show. So potentially some new people are listening uh, because of that. So if you're new and you came and saw the show, thank you so much. If you're old and you saw the show, thank you a lot. If you come, if you listen to the show all the time and you couldn't come to the show because you live thousands of kilometers away, I forgive you. That's right. I forgive you as always, or not as always, but as of recently, we are filming these videos and putting them uh, on, on Patreon. So hello to all of you who are listening as well as our newest uh, Patreon uh, follower. I had the name and it's, and it's, and I've lost it. I'm so sorry. Give me one second. I wanted to give you a shout out straight away as well as a shout out to the other people who are listening. Uh, Lizzie, Lizzie is our newest, uh, Patreon patron. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, as well as all of our other patrons who have been here for a while. Seb, you're a patron and so is Dawn. Uh, and we've got a bunch of free members on there as well. So I just want to quickly at the top of the episode, shout out those wonderful people for your support. And, uh, yeah, how's it going everybody? It's, uh, it's been a minute since we've done one of these. The last episode we did was about Ming, the tiger who grew up in an apartment building in Harlem. And this week I was going to do a story, another zoo related story. Uh, about a polar bear who had mauled two people, but I think I'm going to save that for a, for a future date. Uh, today, we're going to just take a moment to catch up on all the news stories that happened while I was away. It's been two weeks since we've done an episode and a lot's happened, uh, and I wanted to just sort of take uh, take a beat and maybe do a bit of a shorter episode just to give us a bit of a catch up. So in the past, we've called this a zoo news or, or whatever we want to call it. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we are here just to talk about what's happened. Uh, what's happening? What's been going on in the news? It's been a crazy couple of weeks just in the news in general since I've talked to you guys. Dude, Trump got shot. I think maybe that was the day I recorded the last episode, but Trump got shot and then Biden just left the race and then a bunch of other stuff has been going on in Paris. The Australian, I think, bicycle team had their car broken into. A lot's going on. Um, I did... I, I will say at the outset, I got a very interesting email this morning from, um, I'm going to describe this person as disgruntled, potentially, um, kind of, um, what would you say, suggesting that I refrain from commenting on uh, any American politics, uh, because I don't know anything about American politics except what the media makes up. I don't know what that was referring to. I know sometimes I say like off off kilter remarks about American politics and guns and stuff like that. I don't think I get particularly political on the show. Um, but you know, <laughs> this person thinks I do and thinks I should refrain from commenting. Uh, they'd like to listen to the show, but every time I talk about this, they have to stop, which is like, okay, uh, stick with the animal stories and I'll continue. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep doing whatever I want to do. And you can listen if you want to, or you can go and watch Fox news or Alex Jones or Tucker Carlson, or whatever you want to listen to. Um, but I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And if you want to join, you can, that's great. But I would just recommend that if you can't hear other opinions or opinions that differ from your own, um, I would probably just say that you're going to need to 
learn how to do that because that's what the world is. It's people with different opinions. Uh, so yeah. Plus, you know, I'm not American. I don't live there. I don't talk about it a lot. I am. I think I'm pretty well informed when it comes to American politics, like more than the average Australian. And also like this thing about not knowing anything except what the media makes up. Like I don't, I don't listen to your media. Like I live in a different country and our media is actually pretty, it's not the best, pretty balanced Australian media. So I get a fairly, I can get a fairly balanced uh, picture of what's happening over there and make up my own conclusions. Uh, yeah. Not a political podcast at all, but I'm not going to refrain from talking about things because it makes you uncomfortable. So sorry, but you are right. Let's stick with some animal stories so that you can continue. Let's do that. All right, jumping into the news. Uh, what is this headline? Nothing to do with Biden. Excellent. Okay, a 72-year-old man has been hospitalized after a killing grizzly bear that attacked him while picking berries. This man was picking berries and was attacked by a bear. Um... And he was 72 at the time. That's uh, that's old. Okay. Uh, so the first line is the 72-year-old's condition remains unknown. I'm going to really quickly refresh all these pages because I did bring them up yesterday. And in case there's been any updates on the, on the news articles, I don't want to be misinformed as I apparently am from our American reader who has emailed me today. Okay. By the way, if you are the person who emailed, uh, don't. This is an attack on you. I love you. You're great. Just... I'm going to do me, and that's you can decide if you want to continue or not. Okay, a uh, 72-year-old man picking berries in Montana shot and killed a grizzly bear that attacked him and left him seriously injured last week, officials say. The man, who has not been identified, was at Flathead National Forest land. Uh, sorry, was at Flathead National Forest lands off the North Fork Road on July 18th when he quote reported encountering a bear that charged and attacked him. A Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks official said in a news release, the bear was shot and killed. The department added. Officials noted that it was determined that the man who was hospitalized acted in self-defense. The 72-year-old man's condition remains unknown at this time. Uh, People, People has reached... Oh, that's the publication. Okay, they're copying this off. This is on Yahoo News. People has reached out for a comment. FWP wardens and bear specialists responded to the incident and confirmed that an adult grizzly bear was killed, the agency added. FWP is working to verify if any cubs are present. It is unclear what led to the attack, but spokesperson Dylan Tabish told the Associated Press that the bear was responding defensively to guard cubs. Tabish stated that if the cubs are located, it is unlikely officials will be able to find appropriate facilities to take them. Oh, God. Okay, that's sad. Depending on the age, we might leave them in the wild because they have a better chance of survival rather than have to euthanize them, the spokesperson added. In their release... Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks reminded park visitors that the state is, quote, bear country, and they should be prepared to encounter both grizzly and black bears in the state. Quote, avoiding conflicts with bears is easier than dealing with conflicts, officials advised. Uh, There you go. Okay. Short two minute read. Uh, But yeah, I mean, it's good that this guy survived. It's unfortunate that his condition remains unknown. It would be very good if we could get an update on that. In fact, I may just Google, do a quick cursory Google search while I waffle at you um, just to see if there is an update in the last day. Because as I said, I did find all of these um, stories yesterday. Um, He's yeah. I mean, this one says he's been seriously injured. It doesn't say if he's survived or not. Um, or what his condition is in hospital. Yeah, there seems to be no real update there, unfortunately. But let's go back through. Um, so people trying to figure out the cause of the attack. With bears, it comes down to like a handful of reasons, typically, why why you would be attacked by a grizzly bear. Um, it, seeing as it was a female grizzly bear, the cubs theory is, is quite uh, plausible, uh, and I would say likely even. Um yeah, like, and if they find the cubs, it's a shame. I don't know what that means that they won't find a facility for them. There's plenty of places that can take bear cubs, I guess. I would probably, oh, yeah, it's a shame. This is a really tricky one because if you just leave bear cubs by themselves, there's a chance that they'll just die. Um, they won't survive. Um, but then on the other hand, like, it's better than just euthanizing them. So I hope that they are, uh, well, either, either found and taken to an appropriate facility where they can survive uh, or or they're not found and they can just grow and fend for themselves and see how they go. Um, 
Yeah, we will. I guess we'll just have to see what happens with this one. If we get a follow up in the next week on this man's condition, we'll let we'll let you know. Um, yeah, that uh, yeah. Again, really short story. Not a lot of information there. Um, it might be a follow up pup for next week if we can find out what happened to this guy. And also, once he survives, uh, if he survives the hospitalization and people can interview him, it'll make uh, you know it'll it'll make it far more easy to figure out what happened because he can probably just tell us yes there were some bear cubs or yeah i was throwing berries at the bear or whatever the reason was um so we will we will leave that one there but good good on him for surviving um it's a you know he he, oh, he also killed the bear too that's the thing so it, what he was just like did he sh- did i read he shot the bear is that correct the bear was shot and killed the department added yeah so this guy was going berry picking with, well, like a rifle or something. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I guess be prepared. I was going to make fun of this guy for having a gun while berry picking, but hey, he is correct. He was attacked by the bear and he survived probably because he had it. So yeah, well done. Yeah. I'm forever grateful I live in a country where I, I can go berry picking um, without a rifle. Not that I ever would go berry picking. That seems awful and I wouldn't want to. And I don't like berries that much either. So uh, all around win for me. Um all right, let's move on. Uh, oh, yeah, this story. Okay, so an Australian has been attacked by a shark. Um, this popped up on my TikTok uh, because it happened, uh, yeah, in Australia, obviously, but people were commenting on it because it was quite a brutal story. Uh, I was really interested. So apparently this guy's leg washed ashore and that they are trying to attach it. And this this Guardian uh, article does ask the question, what happens if you do lose a leg in a shark attack? Can it be reattached? And in what circumstances can it be reattached? So um, we're going to read this story now. Um, An Australian surfer was attacked by a shark. What happens if you lose a leg and can it be reattached? Kai McKenzie's leg was transported to hospital. Here's what surgeons say about limb reattachment. So this story, it seems like it's going to be more to do with the limb reattachment stuff, but I'm actually really curious at like what level can it be reattached? What are the caveats there? So let's, let's learn a little bit. Um, All right. A surfer and his severed leg were airlifted to hospital after a shark attack earlier this week, sparking speculation that surgeons may be able to reattach the limb. Kai McKenzie was surfing on the mid-north coast of New South Wales on Tuesday morning when a suspected three-meter great white shark bit him. McKenzie was able to fight it off before catching a wave into shore where he was treated with makeshift tourniquets to stem the bleeding. Gonna say, dude, he had his leg bitten off and he surfed back to shore. That is that is badass material. Kai is, this guy's cool. I want a beer with him. I don't drink beer. He can have a beer and I'll have a mocktail. The leg washed up on shore a short time later after the attack and locals put it on ice before it was transported to hospital. Uh, quick thinking from the locals. Well done. This must have happened before. Oh, here we go. Wow, this is... Uh, Mackenzie was recovering in John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle. That's where I live. I live in Newcastle. And John Hunter Hospital is where I was born. Um, isn't that a nice little bit of uh, trivia? Chapman trivia. There you go. Uh, so I was going to say mid-north, uh, mid-north coast of New South Wales. That's fairly close to where I live. I thought maybe it might be a bit further north. But uh, yeah, the John Hunter would probably be the biggest hospital near him. If you went past it, you would just be in Sydney and there's plenty of hospitals there. But yeah, John Hunter Hospital. Um, I think one of my friends works there actually as a nurse. And my sister did work there as a nurse, but she doesn't anymore. Um, Yes, uh, Mackenzie is recovering in John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle in a stable condition on Thursday. A family spokesperson said it has not been revealed if the reattachment surgery was attempted. But how do surgeons decide whether they attempt to limb reattach and what happens if they do? So... Point one, how soon do you have to get to hospital? Severed limbs should be taken to hospital in less than six hours to avoid muscle death, the president of the Australian Society of Plastic Surgeons, David Morgan, says. He says, muscle starts dying as soon as you start removing it from a blood supply, so you often get irreversible muscle death within six hours, he says. The sooner you can get it back there, the sooner you can start to get a blood supply back into it, the better off you will be. Yep. So, yep, within the first six hours, I guess, and the sooner the better. How should limbs be stored? It's good to have, it's good to keep a severed limb moist and cold, but don't put it directly on ice, Morgan says. That's what I've always heard too, with, if you re, if you cut off your finger, you can reattach it, but you put it in a bag 
with like in in ice. You don't put it directly on ice because it can get frostbite. Uh, the doctor says wrap the amputated piece in something moist and then put that in a plastic bag and then put that plastic bag on ice in a small esky. Uh, or even, oh, for those of you who aren't Australian, an esky is like a cooler, basically. I don't know why we call it an esky, but I've always preferred that than cooler. But yeah, an esky, a cooler. Or even put it on a bag of frozen vegetables, he says. But you can't just place the piece directly into the frozen vegetables because then it just freezes and that destroys the tissue. Storing and transporting the limb appropriately will improve the chance of the limb surviving and healing properly if reattached. If it has been 24 hours and carried out of the deep forest and not stored properly, then you wouldn't even attempt it because it's just not going to work, Morgan says. So, point three, can all seven limbs be attached? Now, even if the patient gets straight to a hospital and the limb has been stored appropriately, doctors may decide the limb is too damaged to be useful. Surgeons can keep the limb alive and reattach it correctly, but it is not certain whether the limb is capable of recovering and functioning functioning normally. That's a very difficult thing to predict because you can do a perfect nerve repair, uh, but the nerve may not always recover. So some of this is a bit of an educated guess, Dr. Morgan says. A leg with nerves completely severed may be completely numb forever, and that's not really a functional limb if you can't really feel your foot at all. I guess that's that's fair. I'd rather, I guess you'd rather just have like a little peg or or a prosthetic limb. If you can't feel it, what's the difference? You don't have to, you still have to wash it. That's a pain. A leg, uh, oh, sorry. If a limb is unlikely to be functional after the operation, a patient may be better off and find it easier to return to a normal life with a prosthetic limb. There you go. So how do surgeons reattach limbs? Once the patient goes to hospital, they'll need to survive their injuries and blood loss. Then, if the doctor decides to go ahead with the procedure, the first thing to do is remove the parts of the limb that are beyond saving. After that, doctors would get a blood supply back into the limb, connecting the major artery back into an artery in the patient's body through a small pipe. Then the reattachment begins. The surgeons would start by trimming back the damaged bones and reattaching them with metal plates and screws. Once that's been done, you would then work through rejoining the blood vessels, rejoining the nerves, putting the muscles back together, and then putting the skin back together, Morgan says. Blood vessels would be stapled or stitched around a small conduit, while veins, arteries, muscles, and tendons would be stitched back together. This, every now and again, I just remember how incredible medicine is and how far we've come along. If this was like 100 years ago, they'd be like, yeah, just stick some leeches in it, make him fuck the shark, and his leg will grow back like a lizard. Now we're like, yeah, we'll just like staple blood vessels around a small conduit. And it's, it's, it's very uh, incredible. Well done. Um, point five, how complex is the reattachment procedure? Yeah, I've always thought like you can't just stick it back on. That's not really how that works. While all plastic surgeons are trained in the microsurgery skills required for a reattachment, the procedure is, quote, among the most challenging things that we do, Morgan says. He asked, It's also not what I thought plastic surgeons did as well. I think plastic surgeons get a bad rap. When you think of plastic surgery, you think of like um, lip filler and facelifts and tummy tucks, right? But I guess plastic surgery is more of a noble, now that I think about it, it's quite a noble profession because it's like, those are all like, you know, elective cosmetic procedures, but there's also like plastic surgery comes in handy when people have like really bad injuries uh, to their face or the rest of their body, you know, like burns. They, you know, they do their best to make your face as close to normal as they can. Um, <coughs> excuse me for that gross cough. Um, and yeah, I guess, I guess limb reattachment surgery is also a thing that they do, which I'd never really thought of. I thought that was just like another surgeon would do that, but... There you go. Um, Morgan estimates that a reattachment operation could typically take 10 hours or as many as 24 hours, depending on the circumstances. Surgeons from multiple specialities are needed to cooperate on the different parts of the limb, and the reattachment process is slow and difficult. Quote, There's no fancy laser that will blend things together, Morgan says. It's all very much hand-eye coordination under the operating microscope to put it all together, which is why it takes so long. The reattachment process can be made more difficult depending on the type of surgery or injury, Morgan says. 
a very clean sharp cut will be much easier to put together than something that's got a lot more crush or a broader zone of tearing he says Furthermore, the process of trimming and cutting out the injured bone and tissue means the reattached limb could be shorter than it was before. Oh yeah, that's awkward. You often end up shortening the limb a little bit because all the tissue in that injury zone is not useful. So that limb ends up being shorter than the other one, even if it is successful. Yeah, I imagine that with a shark attack, like that is a more of a crushing and a ripping injury than if you just like, you know, lightsabered your leg off. So, um... Yeah, and I hadn't thought about that. Like you, you would have to remove quite a quite amount of tissue and bone. Um, so yeah, you end up walking around on on a shorter leg. I wonder what I wonder if that's what's going to happen to Kai. Interesting. Um, point six. The question is, what happens after the limb attachment procedure? Limb reattachments need to be monitored closely at first to ensure their connections keep working and they don't develop any infections. Like a plumbing joint, it can leak or it can block, and occasionally you need to take those people back into the operating room to fix one of those problems, Morgan says. Once the wound has healed, patients will need to start rehabilitation, including moving the limb joints with their hands as they won't be able to cover actively sorry, they won't be able to actively move the limb itself until the nerves recover. You don't want them to stiffen up so they go through the process of passive rehabilitation, just to keep things supple, Morgan says. There's passive physiotherapy that can continue for months as the nerves recover, depending on how far the amputation is from a major nerve collection in the hip or shoulder. A nerve will recover at one millimeter a day once it starts to recover. That's cool. So if you've got an amputation at the mid thigh, it might be six months before you get something in your foot. A finger or toe reattachment at the knuckle will recover function more quickly. Do reattached limbs work? That's point seven. The vast majority of reattached limbs will stay alive and have some level of function, but they may not return to the way they work before the amputation. Morgan points to increased use of hand and arm transplants in recent years, many of which are technically successful, but many of which give people improved function, but they're not working like a normal hand. As with the pace of healing, amputations closer to the shoulder or hip will likely be less likely to recover. Um, the closer to the shoulder or hip you get, then the more significant the damage is, and the longer it will take to recover, and the less likely it will be to recover. Okay, so if you want to get your leg cut off, you want to go as low as you can, I guess. Hmm. People with reattached limbs that don't successfully recover may opt for an electric elective amputation and the attachment of a prosthetic limb. Jesus. This is getting dark. How common is it for a limb reattachment? Reattachment of fully amputated arms and legs is not common, Morgan says. You're probably not doing more than a handful a year at a major trauma center. Surgeons more regularly attach or repair limbs that have been mangled but remain attached to the bodies. We do get a lot of pretty significant lower legs in car accidents and motorbike accidents, Morgan says. The whole thought process of can we save it, should we save it, is practiced in major trauma centers every week. Well, there you go. That's a really that was a really insightful, interesting article about something we don't talk about a lot, which is the rehabilitation after an animal attack. Um, yeah, Kai. Uh, I wonder if there is a more. Yeah, I'll see if I can click a link to find a more in depth story of what happened to Kai. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Let's let's read this. Okay. So we already know what happened, but we'll go back and maybe get some more information. Um, the severed leg of a surfer has been retrieved after it washed up on a beach after a shark attack off the mid-north coast in New South Wales. Kai McKenzie, 23, was surfing at North Shore Beach near Port, Port Macquarie. There you go. That's near where we are. On Tuesday morning, when a suspected three-meter great white shark bit him. McKenzie was able to fight it off before catching a wave into shore while onlookers and an off-duty police officer treated him with a makeshift tourniquet to stem the bleeding. After his, though his leg was severed, it washed up on shore a short time later after the attack, and locals put it on ice. Mackenzie and the leg were both airlifted to hospital amid hopes that surgeons might be able to reattach the severed limb. It has not been revealed if the surgery was successful. And as we read in the other uh, article, it's not even revealed if the surgery was attempted. We don't know that yet. After assessing photographs of the injuries, New South Wales government shark biologists believe a three-meter great white shark was involved in the attack and inflicted severe injuries to the surfer's right leg. 
New South Wales Ambulance Service Hastings South Acting Duty Manager Kieran Mowbray said Mackenzie was recovering in hospital in a serious but stable condition. Mowbray said a quick-thinking off-duty officer saw the incident unfold and rushed to help. He used the lead of a dog as a tourniquet to wrap around a young man's leg and essentially saved his life until the paramedics got there. Mackenzie was taken to Port Macquarie Base Hospital and later transported to John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle on Tuesday afternoon. He was quite calm and able to talk to us. He was completely worth it. He was completely, oh, he was completely with it. He's a really brave and courageous young man, Mowbray said. Mackenzie, who is a sponsored surfer, has only recently returned to the water after a significant neck injury. Quote, so happy to be back surfing after having a fractured neck, he posted to Instagram in January. Well wishes for, Car- for Mackenzie flowed in from surfing publications after the attack. Tracks sent, to, uh, tracks sent their thoughts to Kai and his loved ones during a difficult time. And Surfer Mag... Oh, Tracks must be a magazine. And Surfer Magazine wished a speedy recovery for this young legend. There you go. A GoFundMe uh, established to... Oh, that's good. Let's, we'll link the GoFundMe in this... In this um, in this podcast episode. You can go find that. A GoFundMe established to assist Mackenzie's family with rehabilitation and medical expenses has attracted more than $70,000 since the page we set up was set up on Wednesday morning. I'll put the link to that in the description and I'll make a donation on behalf of us, but you feel free to go and do that as well. His aunt, Michelle Mackenzie, said the young man was an incredible surfer, skater, musician, videographer, and all-around legend. Quote, He's always lived life to the fullest, squeezing every minute out of the day, she wrote in a Facebook post on Wednesday afternoon. Yesterday, he was attacked by a shark at Port Macquarie doing what he loved, and he suffered life-changing injuries. North Shore Beach is isolated and accessible by a dirt road. There have been several shark sightings in the north of Port Macquarie in the preceding days. A tagged great white shark was detected at multiple locations at Sa- uh, Sawtell near Coffs Harbour on Monday and Tuesday. Lifesavers evacuated the waters at a local beach after sighting an unidentified 2.5 metre shark on Monday. Bite Metrics, a website that provides surfers with data on increased risk of human shark interaction, noted a continued increase in great white shark activity in the area during the past week. The incident came after an attack on a 44-year-old surfer, Toby Begg, by a great white shark on Lighthouse Beach, south of Port Macquarie last year. Begg was saved by an off-duty emergency department doctor. There you go. These off-duty doctors, they're really saving our butts, guys. Well done. Yeah, I hope Kai recovers, uh, well, fully, if possible. Uh, And yeah, if um, if they attempt that limb reattachment, I hope it goes well. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a brave guy to surf packing in after you have your leg cut off. Pretty intense. Um, a lot of these surfers are really, they've, they've got really good attitudes. I'm not a surfer, but I do know a couple surfers. They're always just like the most, the, just the most easygoing, laid back, but like chill, happy people you'll meet. Um, and I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just all the time in the sun and the ocean makes you, makes you a better person. I wouldn't know. I don't spend any time in the sun or in the ocean. I hate the ocean. This is my nightmare and I won't ever touch a surfboard. Um, but okay. Yeah, there you go. Wow. I'm just looking here. Um, uh, Kai McKenzie's road to recovery on GoFundMe. Uh, it's now at 155,000, uh, raised of a total 100,000 targets. So they've made, uh, yeah, they've made a lot. Wow. Someone donated $2,000 just then. That's great. Um, 2.1 thousand donations. Yeah, guys, this uh, link will be in the description. And um, yeah, go and make a donation to Kai. I'll do the same thing. Um, yeah, wow. He's from Bonnie Hills. There you go. All right, let's move on from that. Uh, okay, so another Australian story. Um, the remains of a 12-year-old girl have been found... Uh, after being attacked and taken by a crocodile. So this incident occurred in a remote town called Palumpa in Australia. I've never heard of Palumpa, um, but I'm going to guess it's in either far north Queensland or in the Northern Territory. Uh, this is reported from ABC News, uh, and it was reported at the beginning of this month. So not the m- not the freshest story, um, but let's see what we've got here. The remains of a missing 12-year-old girl in Australia have been found after she was attacked and taken by a crocodile while swimming in a creek, police said. 
The incident took place on Tuesday evening at about 5.30pm local time in the remote community of Palumpa, approximately a seven hour drive southwest of Darwin. So that's in the Northern Territory. Uh, this town has approximately a population of 400 people. Um, yeah. Around 5.30pm last night, police received reports of a missing 12-year-old child who was last seen swimming in Mango Creek, authorities said. Initial reports stated that the child had been attacked by a crocodile. Community members and uh, Pep, uh, Pepimentari, Pepimentari police attended the scene and began searching for the child who was yet to be located. Whoa. Sorry. A video just started. Why can't I turn this off? Stop it. Shh. Sorry. Why did I do that? I just started t- talking about the Olympics and Netanyahu. I don't need to know that. We don't talk politics on this show, remember? Okay. Um, a search team was uh, immediately deployed to the area with officers from Wadye assisting, but several hours later, the remains of a 12-year-old girl were found, according to a statement released by Northern Territory Police. Quote, Northern Territory Police have located the remains near Plumpa, believed to be that of a missing 12-year-old child. The child was reportedly attacked by a crocodile in Mango Creek on Tuesday, the 2nd of July, 2024. An extensive search effort was mounted in in an effort to locate the child. Senior Sergeant Erica Gibson said, This is devastating news for the family, the community, and everyone involved in the search. Police are providing support to the family and community, along with the first responders who attended the case. The Northern Territory is home to the world's largest wild crocodile population, with more than 100,000 of the predators in the wild, according to the Australia's Northern Territory Tourism website. If you've ever wanted to see a crocodile in the wild, Northern Territory is the best place in the world to do it. While crocodiles can grow up to 20 feet long and weigh up to a ton, attacks on humans are quite rare, though officials warn to steer clear of them. They have a taste for fish, but will eat just about anything, including cows and water buffalo, wild boar, turkeys, birds, and crabs, according to the Northern Territory's uh, tourism website. Don't attempt to feed any wild crocodiles during your stay, and don't swim in any waterway or camp, fish, or walk in area area where crocodile hazard signs are posted. The best way to avoid getting hurt is to avoid crocodiles in the wild altogether. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the Northern Terry has the most crocodiles, um, but I did a little research yesterday. Uh, that's not where the majority of um, crocodile deaths actually occur in Australia. Queensland actually has the higher number, uh, even though they don't have as many crocodiles. But my my assumption to that would be, one, Queensland has a higher human population, so there's more people who are going to get hurt. And Queensland also has, from what I would guess, a higher population of tourists uh, who can be mm, less wise about Northern Australian waterways than a native might be. Um, You would never see me anywhere north of like Brisbane. I don't think I would swim in any lake or creek, anything north of Brisbane. Um, It's just not worth it. Like we don't have salties or even freshwater crocodiles this far south in uh, Australia and New South Wales or in Victoria or anything like that. They really only exist in, in, you know, North Queensland and the Northern Territory uh, and maybe the Northern parts of Western Australia. I'm not, I'm not really hundred percent sure on that. It's really that really the, the, the tip, what do you call it? The great, no, not the great Australian, but the Cape York Peninsula and down from there. Um, yeah, it's really sad. And it's, it's, I mean, 12 year, 12 years old, that family would just be just so devastated that it's happened. Um, it occurred in a remote town. So my thought was not initially like that it would be a, a tourist, but potentially, potentially an indigenous, um, population, although indigenous people are typically, uh, wiser when it comes to native animals, including crocodiles and like not swimming where, where they potentially could be. Uh, so I don't know. I, at this point I'm just speculating and I don't know. Um, <coughs> but yeah, it is, it is quite an upsetting story. And I probably should have mentioned uh, that there was the death of a child here, so I, I do apologize. But I feel like we're beyond that um, <laughs> because I've already read the story. All right, let's t- let's talk about uh, something a little bit light, more lighthearted. Um, the Japanese macaque monkey attack victims to get some money. Isn't that nice? Oh, this is an old story. This is an old story. Never mind. We can read it though. It's uh, it's from ten years ago. But let's read it. It's really short anyway. In Tokyo, 
Victims of an ill-tempered monkey that terrorized a town in Western Japan are to be offered compensation, an official said on Thursday. More than 1,000 professional hunters, firefighters, and police officers were mobilized to snare the peaked primate after it set upon 18 people during a weeks-long rampage through uh, a town. The wild macaque was finally cornered in a vacant house on September 9th after 280 people had spent the day searching for it. The monkey was... Oh, the monkey was put down shortly after. <laughs> Damn it. The Municipal Assembly of Hyuga in uh, Miyazaki Prefecture unanimously approved a bill to offer 20,000 yen, which is about $205 US, uh, to each person the male monkey had attacked. Patrols were continuing around the streets in case of further danger, the, off uh, the official said. But we have not found any other monkeys threatening our people, said Kenji Yoshida, a city official. The city has now returned to calm and normal. Macaque monkeys are common in the wild throughout Japan, where the densely wooded hillsides provide a habitat. There you go. Well, you know what? That was October 10th, 20, 2013. So hopefully everyone who needed money got the money and spent it. Um, yeah, damn. Sorry about that. I, I specifically, when I search for these stories, do a thing where it's like, the most recent stories. I don't know how that this one got into the pile, but hey, it doesn't really matter. Uh, let's talk uh, another pretty sad story, uh, although this one does not involve the death of a human. I did see this on my uh, For You page on TikTok, and it is, it is quite sad that a polar bear has actually died in a tragic accident while playing with another polar bear in Canada. Um, you might be... You might be familiar with the story. You might have seen the, the footage. It's quite sad. Um, I'll read this for you. A polar bear at the Calgary Zoo died in a tragic accident while playing with his fellow polar bear companion, the zoo announced on Tuesday. In a Facebook post, the zoo said their seven-year-old polar bear named Baffin died on Friday. Zoo officials said Baffin drowned after sustaining a crushing injury to his trachea that was caused by their eight-year-old polar bear named Siku while they were playing. The zoo said the trachea injury likely caused Baffin to lose consciousness underwater, leading to his tragic drowning. And he Crosby, uh, see, I saw the footage of the woman saying this, and I was like, that's how you say that word. And now I can't say this. Ne ne necropsy. Ne she said ne ne necropsy. Ne necros fuck, I can't say it. A necropsy also confirmed Baffin was in otherwise excellent physical condition with no other signs of illness. Quote, although these findings provide clarity on Baffin's passing, we know they offer little solace to those that loved him dearly, the Facebook post read. Zoo officials said Baffin and CQ engaged in the same type of rough play every day as they shared a long history as habitat mates and enjoyed a, compa a compassionate, a companion, oh, a companion relationship. I've never seen that word used before, companion. Baffin and Siku were both orphan cubs who lived together at another zoo in Winnipeg before coming to Calgary last year. The zoo said that while some might suggest separating bears to prevent such accidents, it would be at the expense of their well-being and desire for companionship. Separating them for our comfort at the expense of their own well-being does not align with our values. We remain committed to providing an exceptional home where once orphan polar bears can thrive, the zoo said. According to the National Wildlife Federation, polar bears can live up to 30, 30 years of age in the wild and possibly even longer in captivity. Baffin was just seven years old. Oh man, it's really sad. And there is, I'm not going to show the video. You can see it if you want to see it. There is actually video of um, the two bears playing that a zoo goer was filming. Um, and yeah, it's really sad because you can kind of see the moment that it happens, like where Baffin kind of gets, they're playing in the water and like, CQ kind of just jumps on on Baffin and then Baffin just kind of like a leg goes up and then just like doesn't come out of the water again. Um, very, very sad. I was also about to say like I have mixed feelings about polar bears in, in captivity, but that's coming from my own personal uh, experience. Like in, um, in the Gold Coast in Queensland in Australia, I don't know if they still have it, but the last time I was there, they did. They have a polar bear exhibit on the Gold Coast. Like, do you know how hot it is in Queensland in summer? Um, it's it's a lot. And I know that they keep those enclosures, enclosures nice and frosty, but it just seemed not a good place for them to be. Canada, I guess, is different because, like, they have polar bears in Canada. That's that's when they go up to the Arctic. That's where they are. So I guess, I guess, 
I guess I'm okay with it. Um, yeah, especially since they seem to be orphaned as well. It's really sad. Yeah, Baffin looked like a cutie. Oh, well. Okay, uh, we've got a couple more stories, which they're both horrible. So, um, I, I, and they both involve dogs. So let's, let's do a little vibe check to see what we'd like to do first. So the first one is more of a dickhead of a day kind of story. It's a woman who's gone to jail for animal cruelty after bashing a dog. Bashing is an Australian word for beating, I guess you would say. Um, there's that, and then there's also a really sad story of a, a boy who's been attacked by a dog who's not expected to survive. And I suspect if I refresh this page, the um, the story will change to did not survive. Boy, yeah. Yeah, or didn't... Okay, it doesn't change, but let's, let's see what happens. So what do we want? Do we want the animal cruelty first, or do we want the uh, awful child being mauled by a dog? Uh, let's get the worst one out of the way first and we can end on a slightly more positive note with animal cruelty. I don't know. Like this isn't, this isn't a good way to end. I should have, damn it. I should have kept the monkey thing to later. Okay. Uh, Brooklyn park dog attack, a boy, boy, not expected to survive injuries. Um, this is in Brooklyn park, Minnesota, mini Minnesota. Yeah. The family of a little boy on life support after a dog attack in Brooklyn Park is speaking out. Three-year-old Coville Allen re- remains on life support, but his family says he isn't going to survive. They've already said their goodbyes and plan to donate his organs in the coming days when he's taken off life support. Doctors are determined. Doctors determine his injuries were too severe. Coville Allen was born in December of 2020. Now at three years old, his family says he has no brain activity after the attack. Quote, This has been a horrific tragedy for our family, the Allen said in a statement to Fox 9. With our tragedy, we would like something good to come from it, so we are donating his organs, and with that, his bright spirit will live on. Last Friday, Coville was in the backyard of a home in Brooklyn Park with his mother, Tasha, and older brother, Christian, to pick out a puppy when they were attacked by two dogs, the puppy's parents. Coville's father, Chuck, explained that there has been misinformation about the incident, adding stress as they grieve. He clarified that the dogs involved were American bulldogs, not pit bulls, and that Tasha immediately fought to free Coville from the attack before police arrived. Chuck explained that while Tasha and Christian were playing with a puppy, Coville was playing nearby. Tasha heard him scream, and she and the dog's owner immediately moved to intervene. By the time the police and an ambulance arrived, Coville had been separated from the dogs and CPR was being attempted. The dogs were put down to remove Coville from the backyard safely. Coville suffered a fractured jaw, skull, collarbone and vertebrae and a punctured lung. Tasha has had two surgeries on her right calf due to her own dog bite injuries and is awaiting a third surgery. Um, yeah, yeah, we've... We've done enough of these on the show um, where I should be kind of insulated by it. But man, every now and again. Yeah. There's nothing to say. It's it's just it's just devastating. Um, and, you know, I love dogs. I love dogs. Dogs are my favorite. I love dogs. I'm a, I'm a dog. Well, I'm not a dog owner now. Was a dog owner growing up. Uh, will own a dog again as soon as I can. This little apartment can't have one because our cat would kill it probably. Um, but man, dogs and little kids just, uh, it, uh, they don't mix. They really don't seem to mix sometimes. Um, all around sad. I will say this story is nothing good at all. Um, it is insanely thoughtful of the parents to to be donating his organs um to be thinking of others at, at a time like this that's uh yeah i i'm not even going to say i'm going to update this story like when we find out that the boy dies because there's no like there's no benefit of doing that it's just a all-round shitty thing that happened oh man and there's a photo of him yeah okay that's just yeah really sad i don't have kids i'm not going to have kids but like no one likes seeing that or hearing about that. Um, great. How about a pick-me-up, everyone? Should we, should we talk about some animal cruelty? Okay. 
All right. These episodes really, really can be a downer sometimes, can't they? All right. Uh, ABC News in Australia reports Lenora woman, Linda Marie, oh, how do I say this last name? D D E W O R B O I E S. Dubois? Dubois? Is like a French name? Dubois? Dubois. Let's go with that. Linda Marie Dubois, jailed for animal cruelty after bashing a dog. A 47-year-old woman from Western Australia's remote northern goldfields has been jailed for 15 months for brutally beating her small dog in broad daylight in the middle of town. Cal- oh, it's Calgary. Okay. Calgary Magistrates Court heard Linda Marie de, de Wobois subjected her Jack Russell dog, Buster, to a prolonged attack, which included swinging him... Oh, s- swinging him by his... <sighs> this is just not a happy episode on any front, is it? I'm going to just put up a little red flag here. I know we've already talked about the deaths of two children today. Um, this just... Mm. If you don't want to hear about the injuries of this dog, you can skip forward a couple minutes, but I will read them to you. Um, subjected her Jack Russell dog Buster to a prolonged attack, which included swinging him by his front legs into a brick wall multiple times and stomping on him. Oh my God. Buster's injuries were so... Buster's injuries were so severe and his hind leg was amputated and he was later euthanized. Fucking hell. I... I was hoping the dog might have survived as a bit of a happy ending, but no. The court heard Di Wobois, who had been in custody since March after breaching her bail conditions, also punched the dog with a closed fist, kicked him in the stomach, and walked along swinging him by one leg and threw him onto the ground. The attack happened on the main street of Lenora, 820 kilometers northeast of Perth, um, at about 9.30 a.m. on New Year's Day 2022. Can I just say, that that does give you a sense of the, the scale of the Australian continent, right? That, like, when you're describing a small town, you usually just go how close it is to the nearest major city. 820 kilometers northeast of Perth. There's nothing closer that's, like, a major city. Oh, wow. I was in Perth. It's a cool city. I don't know if there's much else in that, ta- in that state, apart from mines and... Uh, kangaroos and emus Uh, the court heard the dog was not seized by authorities until january 31st 2022 during which time d wobois had not sought any treatment for his injuries oh what a bitch god damn the abc has chosen not to publish cctv footage released by the rspca due to its disturbing nature that's good i don't want to look at it um so i'm glad i haven't been given the option During Wednesday's sentencing hearing, Magistrate Janie Gibbs described the attack on the defenseless animal as violent, callous, and incredibly disturbing. She noted the dog's small size, estimated to be just about 5 kilograms, meaning Buster was particularly vulnerable. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, and to describe the footage as confronting is an understatement, she said. It was incredibly disturbing to watch what you did. This was a cruel, deliberate, and prolonged attack on a small dog. When she was questioned by authorities, the court was told Di Wobois lied and claimed the dog was injured when she when it was hit by a car in Kalgoorlie. Quote, I don't find you to be remorseful, but I'm sure you're regretful of the position you find yourself in, Ms. Gibbs said. She said Di Wobois offending was an, uh, Di Wobois's offending was aggravated by the time that her buster... Sorry, she said D. Wobois's offending was aggravated by the time that Buster suffered and the fact that she was committing the acts in front of her young children. Okay, I have no doubt he was in pain and no doubt he was frightened of you and in pain for 30 days until he was taken from you, she said. The court heard the former teacher's aide, oh God, she was a teacher, has battled with alcoholism since she was a teenager, which Ms. Gibbs said explained her actions to a degree, but does not excuse the behavior. No, it doesn't. It, it doesn't excuse it at all. And it doesn't explain it at all either. Like, no. <laughs> no, it doesn't. You can be an alcoholic and keep to yourself and not hurt dogs. That's a different thing. That's a That's a monstrous thing. I'm not saying being an alcoholic is good, but I'm just saying that, like, you can be an alcoholic and be perfectly kind to everyone. Um, yeah, that's not an excuse and it's not an explanation at all. I don't believe in that at all. That's terrible. Um, 
Okay. No remorse, says the prosecutor. D. Will Boaz was facing up to five years in jail and a $50,000 fine. It's a shame she didn't get the maximum. That's crazy. She got 15 months. Prosecutor Ian Weldon told the court there was an overwhelming case for imprisonment, arguing against any suspension of the sentence. He referred last year's case of a Perth woman who was jailed for 10 months for animal cruelty for throwing her dog off a two-story car park. What's going on in Western Australia, guys? Jesus. Mr. Weldon said De Wabois had shown serious and deliberate cruelty, and she was not fit to care for animals again. The offender felt able to do this in the main street of Lenora with impunity. An example needs to be set, he said. There is no remorse at all, and she continues to be cruel to dogs. Miss Gibbs says she believes Diwa Boaz's risk of future offending was high. Her sentence was backdated to March 2025, where she was taken... No way. Where she was taken into custody, making her eligible for parole in three months. That is... No. That's way too light of a sentence for this. I, um... Yeah, I'm a look. I'm a lenient guy. I, I'm not a. I don't believe. I, I I believe prison is for rehabilitation. I think that's what it should be for. I don't necessarily think it actually is, particularly in like the United States and Australia. I don't think it really does rehabilitate you. Uh, but like that is no that like for what she did in public, like like three months. She can be in jail for three months. That's not enough time. I I understand she was kept in 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 jail like, since she was arrested a couple of years ago, but like, you know, come on. The maximum is five months, uh, five years and a $50,000 fine. Where's the fine? I'm I'm going to guess they didn't fine her because she can't pay it. There's no point in fining someone for some like something they don't have, they can't give you. Um, yeah, wow. Well, uh, really glad that we ended... Uh, <laughs> We've ended our episode on such a fun note, guys. Uh, the death of a child by a dog and then the death of a dog by a complete maniac. What a lovely, lovely day we've had. Um, so glad you could join me. I'm sure you're feeling the same way. I'm sure you're feeling much better about life. Um, let's, you know what? Let's uh, let's look up some jokes to, to try and make things feel a little better. Funny jokes. What happens if I Google funny jokes? I'm sure that they'll be very tame. Let's have a look. Ooh. 130 hilariously corny jokes that'll make you laugh. I'm going to say about animals just so that we can um, keep things relevant as our writer at the beginning of the episode wants me to do. Keep things animal related, please. Here we go. A big list of animal jokes. Let's make ourselves feel a little better. Oh, wow. It's like, okay. What do you call a sleeping bull? A bulldozer. That's good. How do you fit more pigs on your farm? You build a sty scraper. <laughs> it's because they live in styes. What did the farmer call the cow that had no milk? An udder failure. <laughs> Why do gorillas have big nostrils? Because they have big fingers. <laughs> That's good. And what do you get from a pampered cow? You get spoiled milk. Oh. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm in a, a tremendously better mood after that. Thank you for that. Uh, Ducksters.com slash jokes slash animals dot PHP. Uh, that is going to do it for our episode, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, <coughs> that sounded really sarcastic. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a great time. I apologize for the week off. Next week, we'll be back with a story. It's either going to be about Blinky the polar bear or about the death of a child who um, who fell into another zoo exhibit. Um or maybe both, depending. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, before we go, just a few little things. Um, there's a poster. You can see it in the video, but I have a poster, uh, which you can now purchase on our Patreon. Even if you're not a member on Patreon, you can go there and purchase it as, as a bit of merch. And if you are a member of our Patreon at any price, at any tier, you can download that and print that poster for free. Uh, I printed that one at Officeworks for like 15 bucks. It was great. New frame was like five bucks, 20 bucks. Boom poster i had to pay someone to design the poster uh, but that's but that's that you'll also see another poster behind me uh which is a beautiful hand painted art or hand, hand drawn artwork that was made for me by one of the cast of school of rock and signed by all the children and cast members um and i will admit i cried like a little bitch when i got that so uh, that that was very lovely so yeah um 
Thank you for all of your support, as always. Thank you for the people who have messaged suggestions of stories within the last two weeks. A couple of people asked me where I was. You guys obviously didn't listen to the end of the last episode, did you? I said I wouldn't be here. I told you I was needing a break. Uh, but we are back, hopefully back in, in a week with a, with a brand new story. Uh, as always, we have some bullshit to talk about, some housekeeping, what do, you, what do you call it? If you want to send me an email talking about how you don't like me talking about politics, you can do that at maneaterspod at gmail.com. Uh, um, I, <laughs> I promise you I won't rip on you as badly as I've ripped on this person. But that person, I do respect you. Uh, please respect me. Um, okay, the website, www.manitispod.com. You can uh, check that out for merchandise and all the other stuff. Uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash is We have all of these video recorded episodes going up, uh, as well as a special little uh, series that's going to start coming out. So I, for those of you who maybe don't know, I acted in a web series about 10 years ago um, that was a cute little Australian thing that we did uh, with some friends on a budget of about 10 grand per season. Uh, it was one of my introductions to the world of, of acting and, and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to be uh, re-watching that web series uh, episode by episode uh, and sort of like giving live commentary and reviewing it. And I might have some guests come in and do it with me as well. Uh, not sure yet. It'll be it'll be a great time, and I'm really really excited for it. So, uh, yeah, Jimmy watches the cleanests. We'll call that, um, and that'll be starting soon. Maybe next week. I might do the first episode by myself, and then see if uh, I can get some of the other cast members or the creatives to come in and and watch it with me. Um, maybe my fiance can join me. That'd be nice. We can watch it together. I'm sure she has a lot of questions about like that. In fact, actually, a little little um, a little bit of my personal life trivia when we were meeting we were going to go on a first date and i told her i was an actor she actually looked me up and she found the cleanests and um she was very surprised i didn't look like that anymore and also she also thought my name was greg because she couldn't she forgot that my my name is not my character's name in the show um so yeah, that's a little bit of fun for you there as well. So that series will be starting soon. Uh, yeah, we've got the Instagram at Man It Is Podcast at Jimmy C. Chaps. You can follow us there. And uh, yeah, have a fantastic week, guys. I've, I've missed you. I I hope you missed me. And I will see you guys soon. Please stay safe because as we've learned, it's a jungle out there. Bye.